Hello again, welcome to another edition of Arts and Ideas. I'm Sue Swinand, and today I'm over at the Fountain Street Fine Arts uh, Gallery, and my guests are Cheryl Clinton and Marie Craig, who are the founders of this gallery. And it's the first time that we've done a show over here, and I'm very excited to tell you all about this place because they're doing great things. How long, Thank have, you. How long have you been here? Uh, we've been here, this is our fourth year, so we started in January of 2011 with our first show. So um, we're coming on to four now. Four years? Mm -hmm. And how many artists do you represent? Uh, we have about 18 core and associate artists, which are a, um, a jury level of membership, and then we have about 60 or 65 artists that are um, at large, just want to be part of the the, uh, sort of associate kind uh, of like friend, artist, artist friend. friend. Oh, and that's, nice. That's mm -hmm. open to any working artist. So it, it's. Do you consider it a cooperative gallery, or how does that? We're how sort do you of a, a hybrid between a cooperative gallery and a commercial gallery, being membership based. Um, Marie and I act as the directors and do the majority of the administrative work and the bookkeeping and, and that sort of thing. And all and the other 5,000 million yeah. things <laughs> that you have to do. Exactly. And then the artist members, um, you know, we solicit their advice and we, you know, ask for their input on things. Um, and they do participate in gallery sitting and, you know, some of the PR work. Um, mm -hmm. and, and the artists have a, a lot of creative control over their exhibits and how they use the space. Mm -hmm. So you're doing the overall administrative things, but they have good input into that. Yes. yes. But you are a for-profit gallery, is yes, that correct? Yes, we are. They have other group shows, too, mm -hmm. which are open to the community uh, and other mm -hmm. artists throughout the area. Yeah. And mm -hmm. those come up very regularly, and you have outstanding jurors come in from outside the area who mm -hmm. uh, select the exhibitions. Yes, we, we try to select jurors that um, are high profile, that um, have um, exquisite taste, <laughs> and, um, and are people that an artist would want to have their work in front of. Um, and so we make mm -hmm. a really um, concerted effort to pictures that are valuable to artists in that way. That's a good, mm -hmm. that's a good uh, symbiotic mm -hmm. relationship there. In yeah. other words, for the artist to get their work in front of people who actually could make a difference in their career. Yes. Mm -hmm. Good idea. Mm -hmm. Now, what is your next show coming up? Uh, the next show actually um, will be the members exhibit, Multiplicity, and that will have um, Corn Associate artists, individual works in addition to a series of um, collaborative projects we've been working on over the last few months. As and how about January? Cause and then January is our juried show um, the deadline for entry is actually today, October 22nd. Um, Gotta go and home and do that. Yeah, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> and the juror is uh, Liz Devlin of Flux Boston, and the title of the show is Visual Alchemy. I also wanted to mention you're both visual artists as well, yourselves. Yes, we are. And uh, I remember seeing your works here, but. Mm -hmm. What kinds of work are you doing, Cheryl? Uh, I'm a painter, primarily abstracted landscape imagery um, in acrylic base. My show here in May was Intuitive Navigation, um, and that work can be found on my website, which is cclinton.com. cclinton.com. They were really very beautiful abstractions of sort of trees and water mm -hmm. and things like that. Lovely. Yeah. And how about you, Marie? So I'm a photographer. Um, the f kinds of things that I like to photograph are old, abandoned buildings, places, weeds, things like that. Um, the photographs I like to print on aluminum, so they have um, a really kind of translucent quality, and you can see yourself in the image if it's reflective. And it picks up different lights of the day. It and, does, oh, yeah. That's kind of really nice. Fun. Yeah. yeah. But we should find out exactly where you are in Framingham? Sure. We are at 59 Fountain Street in Framingham, which is the Bancroft Building. We are known as the ugliest building in Framingham. But when you come inside, it's much like a geode, you know, kind of crunchy looking on the outside. And you come in, and it's full of beauty. <laughs> exactly. 
and you it's right next to the railroad track and they have a huge uh, chimney smokestack so yep. that always helps me find it yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what's the address uh, 59 Fountain Street in Framingham and we're about a five minute walk well five to ten minute walk from the Framingham commuter rail stop as well and also they're very close now to the uh, the Danforth Museum mm -hmm. and you were just telling me that you'll only be a few minutes to the other Danforth yeah, location. Um, new, I think new Danforth the new location. Danforth location, um, it's mileage wise is very close. It's just a different intersection. So it might take, you know, five minutes instead of three minutes to get here. And uh, we do have a reciprocal relationship with the Danforth. And if you're not a member of them, you can come visit us first and we can give you a pass to go and visit cool. the Danforth. And now we're, I'm talking with Sarah Fine Wilson, who is one of the exhibiting artists this month at the Fountain Street uh, I want to say gallery. Fine art. <laughs> fine art. Fountain Street Fine Art. And uh, she's primarily a ceramic sculptor, but she incorporates other materials as well. And um, she has a, I've seen her work for many years. Now, you, you were actually a resident at the uh, Craft Center at one point, weren't you? Yes, I was a resident. In Worcester. Yeah, I was a resident, I want to say, in around 06, 07. Um, at the Craft Center, and I was there for, t I believe, two years. I think one year I was a resident, and one year I was working uh, in the studios there. So what is that residency program like? What is um, The residency you? program there is an a awesome opportunity for artists um, who work in ceramics, and I think there, uh, there was a metals one. I think there's a glass one as well. I'm mm -hmm. not quite sure all mm -hmm. the areas. Mm -hmm. But it's an opportunity for an artist to work intensively in their area, get a studio space, and get feedback on their work from um, the faculty at the Craft Center and also the other artists, and find inspiration through connections that way. And also through the exhibitions they do there. Yes. It must be yes. nice to be in-house also. Yeah, we had a beautiful exhibition at the end of the residency. Yeah. Now, you're actually planning, you're going to be in a show there coming up, right? When yes. is that? There's an upcoming show in, um, I believe in March, that is a, a reunion. So of, that would be March 2015. Yes, um, and it coincides with the NSICA conference, which is the uh, National Conference for Education in Ceramic Arts. And where and is that? That's in Providence. Mm -hmm. And so this show is a uh, running concurrently to kind of draw some of those people who may be here from uh, far away to come take a look at some of the work that has been done since our residency um, time at the Craft Center. How many people have are there going to be in that show? How many at, residents? You know, at this point, I'm not really sure. I, I only know of one other person who's going to be in it, and we were both residents at the same time. Uh -huh. So I'm really excited to Were you uh, a local person from the Worcester area before what, um, your education? Well, I, I live in Millbury, um, and I, um, I studied at, uh, well, most recently, prior to my residency, I studied at MassArt, and then after my resi resi residency, I um, went to the uh, MFA program at um, the uh, school in Philadelphia, which is the University of the Arts. University of the Arts in Philly. Yes. Yes. So that's where I got my MFA. Right. Um, Wonderful. And that was in ceramics, particularly? It was in ceramics, yes. Uh -huh. Wonderful. Wonderful. So uh, I want to look at some of these pieces, which are just so unusual. They're, uh, how would you describe them? I guess you'd call it mostly extruded work that... Uh, um, I, I do have a fondness for the extruder. Um, Tell us what the extruder is in case anybody <laughs> the doesn't The extruder imagine is it. a Play-Doh fun factory, but much bigger and more powerful. So. She says a Play-Doh factory. Play-Doh fun factory. <laughs> fun factory. So you squeeze the tubes out of a, a machine, and it's my extruder is um, a manual extruder, so it's all arm power. So the so. point is you put a moist blob of clay into the machine, and, and you press down, and a little, she's, when she says you squeeze the tubes, she means the clay comes out as a tube. You could squeeze it out as a, like a spaghetti too, could you? You can make any shape that you want. But you the could, point you is you're, make, you're make pushing a little, the clay through a little yes. shape, like a, like a cake decorator idea. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So you make miles and miles of this stuff? <laughs> I, I, I'm very, I, it's a type, it, for me it's a vocabulary that I like to use in my work and 
I, like a unit of structure almost. Yeah, yeah. And I think that the, um, the magic is kind of the subtle curves and tears and bubbles and um, unexpected things that happen when you extrude. And even when they fall on the floor and collapse and the, the forms are really interesting to me. And I like that um, they kind of, they don't have my hand on them, but they have my hand making them. You know, I hadn't thought about that before, but the tube that you're extruding, it is, it's machine made, but it, it takes on this organic quality, which is very subtle. Yes. So it's never a boring shape. No. Because it's always, the weight is pulling a little bit or it cuts off a little differently. Mm -hmm. or, so there are always those nuances and subtleties, which is why the pure mathematical, mechanical forms don't always hold our interest because mm -hmm. they repeat and repeat exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that's really interesting. And you can change colors with that machine too, can't you? How do you like, I notice some of them have little threads of right. other colors in the tube itself. So that's um, something that I really like to do um, is I, I make a palette of colored clay um, and then I mix the palette like you might mix paint or however um, you would transform color and um, so I so have, have like to knead I've the got, colors together to make the colors I do, yeah. and sometimes I don't I have like um, I'll have like a white and a blue maybe I'll wedge them together and push them through the extruder or maybe they'll put the white in the extruder first um, squeeze some of the white out and then put the blue in and then it will create a different form so there's a whole so way, there's that wonderful there's system. process of or the the actual process is revealing the form and the color and yeah. wow that's lovely I love it yeah beautiful well no wonder they have so much uh, variation I love the bisque quality too now, are you glazing some of these as well? Um, yeah, these ones over here all have um, a very um, thin coat of clear. I didn't want them to be too shiny, mm -hmm. uh, but I wanted them to appear sealed um, in their finished mm -hmm. form. So tell the audience what bisque would be, for example. Um, bisque, uh, well, bisque fired ceramics is ceramics that has gone through the first firing prior to um, the final glaze firing. So there's no shiny glaze on it. It's, you feel like it's just the raw clay, but it's fired without a seal, without a glaze, yes. which means glass over it, kind Correct. of, right? Yeah. So uh, how long have you been doing the uh, tubes and in, in that particular? Um, I started doing that after I left the craft center. So it's probably like 08 I started working with uh, the extruder extensively. <clears throat> I had always loved um, working with the extruder, but I had never really explored how it made sense for me to make sculptures with it. Mm -hmm. um, do you have an extruder? I mean, do you have a, yeah. your own oh, yeah. ceramic studio where yes. you have all these machine yes, equipment? And <laughs> it's been a project putting it together, but yeah. I always thought having a ceramic studio was a big process, you know, because you just well, have to have so much stuff. you get the tools that you need to do what you need to do. So all artists, yes. you know, who work with anything need to have this stuff. They need to do it, so. And the space to do it in. Yeah. yeah. Now, in some, <clears throat> now, the ones, I actually own a piece of hers. I have to tell this because I'm so proud. But years ago, we traded a piece. And even then, you had the idea of these tubes, but they were, were not extruded. Mm -hmm. She was creating sort of bulbous forms mm -hmm. that were hollowed out. And it's just a pure sculpture, mm -hmm. you know, it's... Uh, formal, very yeah. formal. Yeah. So, formal, exactly. And what about the new pieces now? Some of these don't have, this just has one extruded piece in it. Yeah, too, the, uh, the newest stuff, well, I shouldn't say is the newest stuff. Is this the newest stuff? No, well, yes, this and this is the newest stuff. Um, I'm kind of, I kind of have two things going on right now. The, this stuff over here is um, kind of, I guess you could call it hybrid. So it has ceramic material, it has construction material, it has um, parts of old um, motors, old, uh, my husband used to work on air-cooled Volkswagens and he has these boxes and boxes of motor parts, which are in my studio now. I love the way the cylinders of the machine relate to the extruded pieces. Yeah, so I started kind of, um, 
incorporating other elements into the work um, kind of at chance at first. I just was playing around in my studio because I have piles of stuff and I part of what I, my process or my practice is to take my piles of stuff and play with them and see what resonates um, yeah, while put it I'm together and see yeah. how it speaks and, to each other and to assemble yeah. it in different ways and to lean it on things and to put it inside things and around things and see what kind of works and I had this stuff and I started heaping it up and I just thought it was really for me personally compelling and um, pro provocative mm. and I wanted to make things that um, create kind of a, a question when people look at them that they want to want to know what it is and say and why the heck did she put this little thing up there <laughs> exactly exactly and to sort of kind of get people thinking maybe about things they might normally think about mm -hmm. and to mm -hmm. um, I want to ask you just briefly I hate to okay, cut you off no. but we're, uh, I want to ask you briefly about the uh, wall piece okay just um, a little so bit. the wall piece is a installation piece that um, is Rised of about 600 small extruded parts, and I assembled them in response to the space that they are in. So they're in this gallery space. There are architectural components to the gallery. Up at the top, there's a big, heavy black pipe that comes out of the wall, and that was um, my anchor. Mm -hmm. And then I started there, and I had all these parts that I had kind of painstakingly created, knowing that they were going to come together into a mm -hmm. form, but I did not mm -hmm. have a clear image of what that form would be mm -hmm. until I was in the space that it would exist. And so mm -hmm. when I installed it here, it takes a different shape than when I install it in a different mm -hmm. location. Interesting. Um, but they, um, so these forms um, start with the architecture and then take on a life of their own. So um, you're sort of being influenced by the shapes and directions of the lines in the gallery mm -hmm. and placing those objects on the wall. You know, they almost remind me, I'm looking at a distance here, but they almost remind me of like parades of people, you know, mm -hmm. like evacuating or refugees marching mm -hmm. or something like that because of the linear quality and, and then the differences in the colors and it's a, it's a beautiful, unusual thing for a ceramic work, you know, yeah. I really uh, think well, you're breaking new ground here. Yeah, well I call that piece rhizome because of um, the idea of all the possible entry points and exit points uh, wow. to an idea. Great. So that's kind of... Okay, well thanks so much for talking welcome. with us. And now I'm talking with Mary Spencer, who is the other half of this exhibition at the Fountain Street Gallery, and uh, her work is, as you can see, the two-dimensional leg of this exhibition. Mary, thanks for talking with us. Um, now, you have a very unusual background. I was just asking her about her printing background. Tell us about that. Well, I have printing background in the fine arts end of printing, um, but I also have a printing background in the commercial printing industry in the Boston area. I apprenticed uh, under a master lithographer and spent four years as an apprentice, and you work uh, obviously when you're apprenticing and being paid for it, and then I made journeyman status, so I was a journeyman, and I worked for about 20 years throughout um, wow. printing industry and in offset lithography type yes. things, yes. And there are very few master printers, uh, so I don't. I mean, that was beyond. So was this for books or? This is for print books, uh. posters, um, everything we did. We were, I was a, a journeyman dot etcher, mm -hmm. and we did um, corrections in color. So if I an see. image came out, yeah. we saw it, and they said we want to change the color a little bit. Um, we used a wet edge technique, which is an acid technique, where you actually change the size of the dots on the physical film wow, wow, wow. in each of the four colors. Sounds very complicated. Yes, and then masking techniques, which and were also You were also a fine arts printer because I knew you as a printmaker before yes. I knew you as, uh, these are just drawings, but your, uh, tell us about your fine art printmaking career. <laughs> when I lived in Somerville, I was very close to Mix It Studios. Oh, yeah. And uh, so I did, I used their press facilities 
very large um, press, and did many editions, not editions, pardon me, I did mostly mono Monotypes. Monotypes. No. Uh, which means that the image can change. It isn't an exact um, replica of mm -hmm. one image's conforming to an exact um, mm -hmm. dimension or look. Mm -hmm. And I love printing. It was, it mm -hmm. was very Mix experimental. Mixit is a really uh, nice studio with a big history in the area. And uh, I saw your work in their show out at Holy Cross. Yes. I remember you had the bee piece. Yes, I had a bee the piece bees. there. <laughs> I love bees. I'm a big bee fan. And you have a bee piece in this uh, show. I have a bee piece, a beekeeper put um, and, and ask a question if people would send a photo of themselves as a beekeeper. And Seth sent me a photo, and he has been reproduced for eternity. <laughs> so the drawings are mostly photographs that you're working from? And, yes. And these are drawings that you're, tell us about the medium and the materials. The medium is charcoal. Um, vine charcoal, charcoal pencils, very dense compressed charcoal um, on a rag paper. The that image was rag paper. Rag paper, yes, made of rags, which is high quality. And it means a cotton paper. Cotton really. paper, pardon me, good, good qualification there. Um, is it a watercolor paper or a re what kind of what, well, a rag it's paper? Well, it's a hot press paper, or you can use a rough paper or a hot press. And it is a paper you can use for water medium. So it's like, yes. a, yeah, it looks like it has a little tooth. Yes, like a it has a decal yeah. around the edge, little mm -hmm. decal edge. Um, and I started with photographs that I had taken. Sometimes they're a collage of different photographs. And then I gridded them. You have to grid them up. And it was. Uh, Pardon me, the original photograph was photocopied so that I would have a slightly larger image. Mm -hmm. And then I put tracing paper over that, gridded that paper, and then gridded my paper. The so, large what she's one. saying is she's sort of making a proportional grid on the photograph and then on the big paper so that she can accurately transcribe yes. it onto the new surface. And that is a very exacting technique. I have never in my life worked to that exactitude. Well, the old masters, <laughs> you know, Michelangelo and those guys, yes. they used to do uh, what was called a cartoon. Yes. Which was a big drawing on a big piece of, uh, of paper or cloth that, that would proportionate, make everything proportionate to the frame that they were going to be mm. painting on. So. And then they could easily, because especially with fresco, they had to go quickly and yes. know exactly where, where they were. Yeah, they didn't make changes. So it was a very interesting experience for the last two years. It's the first time I have ever worked this realistically. Um, yeah, and, uh, the work I remember of yours was not that realistic. It was much more abstract. In fact, I've gone back and forth, even if it's figurative, I usually work from a photograph, mm -hmm. but then I would just have a little thumbnail, you know, little drawing, just and then to give I'd, yourself a little yes, structure, and then work. Well, the one of the guy in the water is very abstract yes. from a distance, especially. That one, yes. And uh, you know that for, you would hardly even. It takes you a minute to find the figure in that shape of water and looks like stone or something. But I can see remnants of that, and also the way you're putting together several images sometimes in one frame. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, it, it takes on a, a very unique, uh, and you say you added this as well. Yes, in fact. So um, this was your own photograph, and then you. Yes, and it was from a two and a quarter camera, black and white. This is a photograph from the 60s. And I had, I wanted uh, vertical, more this kind of dimension. So I had to extend certain areas mm -hmm. of, the f of the original photograph. And mm -hmm. then I added this vine-like shape. Mm -hmm. And even though a lot of these This almost looks like metal. You know, it doesn't look yeah. like growing thing. It looks like cast metal. It has such a volume to those little uh, <laughs> shapes. It but also be. I like the way 
the paper brings up the, you know, the charcoal brings up the tooth of the paper and makes nice little yes. changes in textural surface. Very nice. And you can use that particularly um, in the skin, the quality of skin. Mm -hmm. And then this is a wooden mm -hmm. bar. So, and then the other, one of the other drawings with um, Jay in the wood, in the studio. The tattoo guy. The tattoo guy. Um, it was perfect for the use of wood. Yes. Once you blend it yes. in. And the other wonderful thing about charcoal is you can put down a layer and then you use an eraser I to erase it I can see that. I was out. just going to say that. Right. That's so good. These are erased out. And so in other words, she's putting, smudging down a mass of a gray tone and then drawing with the eraser yes. to lift off the lights or uh, light masses or yeah. light lines. Like these are erased out, aren't they? Right. But the one thing, um, I don't use a white pencil. There are white charcoal pencils. So that if there's an area where I really want it to be pure white, like this area here and around here, and usually in the pupils of the eye, pupil and the eyes and the teeth, you have to be very careful because you can erase a great deal, but you will never get back to a pure white, if you would do Or really to a sharp edge. Or to a sharp edge. When you have the reflection in the eye, you want that sharpness. Whereas it, when you erase, you get a soft edge yes. around the eraser. Right. So that's, that's very true. Uh, hmm. It looks good. I think you did a good job. Thank you. <laughs> I love it the way good. you're using these tiny little lines, too. It, it switches off from line drawing to tone drawing. And that's kind of, uh, I like that. I also like the way they feel like uh, prints almost, like etchings or lithographs. So uh, I real, uh, these are very graphic and they remind me of lithographs or etchings yes. or something like that. Are you still doing printmaking? I haven't done any printmaking for a while. Um, I need to uh, go down to a smaller press if I do because those large, the French tool press has a huge flywheel is what they call it and you sort of like have to really pull on it to uh, <laughs> to get your plate through the press itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so, uh, so now you are a member of this uh, gallery, is that this? Yes, I'm an associate Fountain member, Street, yes, uh, for four years. Fine Arts. Yes. And for four years. I believe it's four and years. And she participates right. in many of the shows here and, uh, you know, I've been seeing your work around and you're really uh, doing some new and exciting things and I'm very happy that I got a chance to look at your work closely today and uh, thanks for joining us. I am very happy to be here. Thanks Good Mary. Well that's about it for today and uh, thanks for joining us. Hope to see you next time for another edition of Arts and Ideas.